Greetings, everybody. Did I, did I give you greetings audibly here? We working? Great. Uh, thank you all for coming. I know you're as excited as I am. We've looked forward to this evening for a very long time. Uh, we have with us tonight not just a superstar of American business, but a, a Purdue graduate superstar. And uh, uh, as uh, she will undoubtedly uh, make plain during the next hour, the, the life of a CEO, uh, one of the few people of either gender, but certainly one of the very few women at this point who both who founded and then led to a successful public offering, a, a now a public company. Uh, that, 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 that's a busy life. And so it took a while to get her here, but it's going to be, I know, worth the wait. Uh, you, uh, I'm sure, are pretty well acquainted with the facts and figures. I hope we've given you something that reminds you, if not. But thank you for being here, and thank you for helping me welcome our friend and alum, Julie Wainwright. So I got to start in the obvious place. How's business? <laughs> well, uh, we're a public company now, so you're going to have to wait for the quarterly results. <laughs> well, you can tell us a little something like, what's hot? What's selling? Um, well, let, let me just say, um, we really did suffer during COVID because we don't make anything. We pick up things from other, we recirculate goods. So we couldn't go into people's homes and pick up things. Um, and people weren't willing to come to our stores and drop them off. So we had a rough time, but we are back. And I would say everything sells within 90 days. And there's some, I mean, there's some old favorites. Mm -hmm. And those are things like Louis Vuitton and Chanel and Hermes. And, and if these names are like sound expensive, we are a value play. <laughs> so, uh, so the top brands continue to perform. Uh, jewelry, fine jewelry and watches mm -hmm. are on fire right now. Um, but people are buying dresses and men are buying ties again. Believe it or not, we can't keep ties in stock. I knew I should have worn one tonight. <laughs> it was the last bad decision I made today. So. Um, I'm sure many, you probably have many customers or, certain, or students who have studied the, the innovation that is your uh, company, but uh, for the benefit of those who might not be completely clear, just talk about the business model. I mean, you, you uh, invented a better mousetrap. Right. I mean, uh, uh, yeah, so what I did in uh, about 2010, I had sort of mapped out where I thought e-commerce was going and what position Amazon would play. And I wanted to get back in that business. It was clear to me that if an, another person made it and it wasn't high end, because Amazon isn't a luxury destination, Amazon would resell it. All right. So you really had to compete at a different level. And, um, and then the luxury space was interesting, but I knew I wasn't going to start a new luxury brand. And there were other brands that um, I thought were going to start happening. I really thought um, clean cleaning products were going to be on the rise and also uh, organic makeup, which, was on the, which is really hard to do, but more natural products in every category. It's beauty being a low barrier to entry, a fragmented market, not a high cost or te run test, and the same thing, cleaning products, not a uh, pretty low barrier to entry at the beginning because there's always people to actually be your manufacturer. But I had, but I had no ideas, and then I'm shopping with a friend who is in a boutique, who buys everything in the back of the store, which the woman called the vault, which was consignment. And I had never seen her buy a consignment before. And when we walked out, I'm like, I wanted to know what just happened. <laughs> and I said, what, would you ever walk into a consignment store? She said, no, they're dirty and it's too hard to find things. And I said, would you ever shop on eBay? She said, no, too many fakes. And I don't want to go back and forth with someone. I said, but you will buy previously owned things. She goes, oh, of course. It's, why not? It's a great deal. By the way, this is one of the most successful venture capitalists in the Valley. So she wasn't doing it to save money. She was doing it because she loves a deal, and everybody loves a deal. And um, so that was it. I researched the luxury market. I researched the um, value trapped in people's homes. I tested all the competition, and I decided the only way this is going to win 
and it's a huge untapped market. There's about $200 billion worth of trap products in people's homes value now across the U.S. That's just a U.S. number. Products that are five years or older that people have in their home that they are not recirculating, the $200 billion um, opportunity right there. And I thought, okay, how are we going to do this? Um, how am I going to get it? And I thought, well, I'm going to have... I'm going to have to go get the product. I'm going to have to operationalize it so we authenticate it because there's too many fakes in the market and that'll ruin the business. So I'm going to have to provide a full service both on authentication and taking pictures and then pick, pack, and ship and customer service and a full sales team that goes to your house and, and gets it. And um, that's how we got started. We're still doing that. And almost the model is almost exactly what I laid out at the beginning, what's different, and it's, it's really changed the business. We are using AI and machine learning in a way that I couldn't have imagined in 2010. The business launched in 2011, but I couldn't, couldn't have imagined. And then the other thing, which I didn't know about, um, the fashion industry is the second or largest polluter in the world, and every second, we get a truckload going into a landfill with, with, unused, with fashion that's being discarded, mostly fast fashion. So it's a really dirty industry. Recirculating goods is one of the easiest ways to do something good for the planet. I learned that about two years in. And I would say we really understood the power of machine learning and AI about probably three years ago. And it's, it's revolutionizing our business and also providing a competitive moat. Um, as, as has been our practice, we have some students with us who are going to ask questions toward the end of the hour, and I know they're going to ask uh, a number of the more uh, personal and career-oriented questions, so I'm going to stick to the, the fascinating business which you have invented and uh, businesses you're disrupting and, and uh, some of your past business experience. Now, I learned some new terms. This may shock you, but I don't know a lot about fashion. <laughs> Maybe it doesn't shock you. And, um, but I, I, like, Fast fashion was a new term to me. I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure I'm a slow fashion type, but I mean, I, 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 I don't know. Fast fashion, I thought was, uh, or was you know, army surplus, but. Um, At least that would be something that would recirculate. Yeah. No, fast fashion tends to be products that sell usually way under $50. And it's discarded regularly. It's following the trends. They don't tend to make, uh, they don't have innovation. They're copiers. Mm -hmm. um, there's a company called Shine that's sort of done uh, out of China that exploded during COVID. And they went there, I think they're about $19 billion. You can probably wash their things twice or three times and they break down. Mm -hmm. So if you just think of the economics, if you buy an item at, you know, in a store or online for $20, and then let's say they have to, all the distribution costs, shipping costs, and you know they love when they throw in free shipping. So if you just run the economics, that item probably costs less than a dollar to make. Now think of the workforce. This is not an automated item. It's not like machines are making it. Think of what the workforce is making. And then think about the products and think about the materials those things are made with. And they are real, they're dis, it's disposable fashion. It's meant for you to throw it away so you keep giving them $20 every other month. And it's a blight. It is absolutely a blight to the planet. Um, and it is, that company in particular doesn't, isn't under any pressure right. to change their uh, manufacturing standards or to embrace any kind of climate change. The ones out of Europe with Zara is one. Um, is under pressure because there's European laws to conform and do you know be a better actor. They have a long way to go. H and M is another one. So there are other companies, but um, it's it's a pretty tough. It's really really hard if the U S doesn't regulate it because uh -huh. it just it throw people throw it away. Literally three wears you throw it away. So one more terminology question: the name of the company. The real real. Yeah. You want to know the origin or what it was? Uh, yeah. I mean, right. what, what's it? What's it? Uh, I know it's telling me something, but I'm too dense to get it. Well, so what? <laughs> so so what's the origin? And so, what is, it's obviously working. So what is it? Uh, well, I'm good at setting objectives. Uh -huh. I'm bad at naming. Uh -huh. So I wanted to make sure that we people felt comfortable that everything was authentic, 
And then it came down to three people sitting in a bar looking for what URLs we could name that actually <laughs> matched that objective. And we couldn't get real, but we could get the real real, I think for $39, and we're like sold. Yeah, I love that. Uh, the, um Wait, funny, there was no squatter on that URL. I don't know why. <laughs> there, there is now. It was, it was fate, you know. Um, so you, uh, I, I, now that I know what fast fashion means, good for you. You've disrupted or made life more difficult for some well, people I, making. Um, I don't know if we're doing enough against them. I'll tell you the brands are threatened, the, the luxury brands. Well, we that was really, going to be my question. Right. One of their executives said you're his, or his or her, worst nightmare. Yeah, that was uh, Chanel. Yeah, so uh, <laughs> what's it like to be a nightmare? Well, just to continue that meeting, it got... The next thing was, the question was to me, would you like some coffee? I said, I'd love some. They said, get it yourself. <laughs> and, um, and it got worse. The meeting actually got worse. So that this is, uh, so I, you know what happens is we actually are giving people value from the goods that they've already bought. It is a value play. In many cases, the brands feel like we're democratizing their luxury brand. They don't, in fact, Chanel actively tried to stop us uh, multiple times. It's all in a lawsuit. They filed one against us. We filed one against them. It's, uh, that's about all I can say about that. But the brands are, um, until they're forced to come up with more green solutions and they have to reinvent their supply chains, they're not going to do it. The European laws are starting to force them. This is a quick win for them. They think if they sold you a product, they own you, they own that forever. But in fact, the law's on our side. Once you buy it, you own it. You have the right to do with what you want with it. So um, brands are very, very uncomfortable with us, uh, with us and any business doing this, but we're the leader. Um, they weren't as, they don't like mom and pop uh, consignment stores. Chanel in particular has sued little, like consignments, individual owners. But when you have the, you know, we have the world's largest luxury reseller, where they feel we're a threat. Now, if they were, if they understood economics, they would understand that the resale value is always checked before the primary sale on the smart shopper, and most of shoppers are smart. So if you bought an item, if you had a choice, let's say each thing was $1,000, and one had a resale of $900, and one had a resale of $30, you might change your perspective on what you're, where you're going to spend your money. Resale, the secondary market, always supports the primary market. But they don't see it that way. They're the worst. Um, LVMH is begrudgingly, they acknowledge us, but they're not great. And caring is great but they're, everyone's probably going to try and do it themselves, and that's okay, too, because it's hard. And we'll win. <laughs> I know where my money's, who my money's on, but now you're growing fast. Again, Way up in we double weren't. digits. We weren't. We mm -hmm. weren't. During COVID, we went, um, uh, we were, I always talk in GMV, which is a term for gross material value of the things we sell, but we pay our revenue the, the business model for our revenue is we take a percent of sale. On average, we get 35 points. So that's our real revenue number. But I think in terms of GMV, and GMV, we were a billion before COVID. Mm -hmm. And we were growing. This is like this, anyone that runs a business or aspires to, this is a shocking number. We were growing 40% in February of 2020. In March, the second half of March with the shutdowns, we were declining 45%. We had an 85-point swing in the business, and we ended the year uh, down, I think it was down about 6% versus previous year, but that's really a 46-point swing from where we started it. And then last year, we were up again 40%, and now we're growing at a healthy clip. I want to come back to COVID uh, in a different connection in a little bit. Um, but business is full of things you can't control, and but then there are things that uh, that you can, or that are uh, at least are more foreseeable. So you are uh, you've been labeled fairly accurately uh, as a disruptor. Disruptors really make the world go round. That's the that's how the how the system eventually turns up innovation and new new opportunities and new growth and so forth. 
but um, uh, who, who might disrupt you? you uh, all well, great business people look over their shoulders. Sure. So. I mean, of course. I think my <clears throat> goal is to get resale to be one of the options. I think at least for the time being, there's so much product trapped in people's homes mm -hmm. that we've, we're going to have a really long run. So, for example, I do expect different, maybe one or two brands to try to do it themselves. That's fine. When you have that much product mm -hmm. hanging out, that all that does is legitimize the space. So I'd say we probably have a 20-year run, and by then I'll be really old, and someone else will be smarter, and they can figure it out. But I do believe this is a brand that's going to stay for a long time because we've got a huge moat, um, and it's really, really hard to do. And consumers are waking up that resale is a good thing for the planet. That's number one. Two, value play. Number three, every item is unique. So we have a single SKU uh, technology, which means if you're a shopper and you buy something on the real real, there's a good chance you won't see it on someone else, which is also a nice thing. So you can find beautiful, unique things at a great deal. I think 20 years from now, you'll be working on the second or third new company that you invented in the meantime. I do have a few more ideas, yeah. <laughs> but we'll see. Um, what was the IPO process like? Um, well, it wasn't, um, here's the interesting thing, in case for anyone who ever takes their company public or, has, or is considering it, at least in the tech world, there are two bankers that everyone loves. One of them is Morgan Stanley, and the other one is Goldman Sachs, and they are first rate. There is no doubt about it. But that's not who we chose. And so who we chose was, a, was the people that tried the hardest in, in the pitch and that really got deep in our category and understood the space and didn't dial it in. So we went um, contrary to the gold standard banker. So as a CEO, um, that's not really what your board wants you to do, just so you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they want you to go with like, you know, the people that, um, but it really, uh, in this case, it really worked out for us. So that was, you know, you choose your bankers based on the pitch and, um, and then you just get on the road and you sell and you sell and you sell. And there's certain things I, you know, you forget. Like you forget, when, and we're doing it in the summer, you forget how hot New York can be, how hot, fast it can rain on you, and how over con air conditioned every room is. So we would <laughs> walk in there and I'd be like shivering because I went from being, you know, rained on to like ice cold. But honestly, uh, explaining the business while it's complicated, got a very good reception. So it was good. And it's, um, and then, and then we had a party, which, you know, yeah, was yeah. A, not a bad thing to do. And then that was interesting with my management team because I wanted 80s bands and they wanted cool bands. <laughs> and uh, I won. <laughs> but I don't win a lot of these things. I'm like, let me just have this one. Well, you win the important ones. You know, um, just to pursue that one step further, I mean, I've known a number of people. You, to me, you were doing one of the most challenging things. Any IPO is challenging. A bunch of beady-eyed people who, want to, who are paid to be skeptical and so forth. Um, oh, I've got to talk about what happened after because that's actually harrowing, but we'll talk about that. Well, then just one quick yeah. question. But you were also explaining to them a category that they knew nothing about. And I've known a couple of people. That's a double hurdle to, uh, to, uh, they, they, uh, to uh, get over, uh, it seems to me, because Especially since they the think buyers they are understand. Men. No, and yeah, the, buyers, yeah. the buyers of the stock who you're selling to are men. Yeah. Our audience is primarily women. Mm -hmm. So a couple things. You mentioned that I was one of the only female founders. There's only been about 20, I think there's 25 of us now ever um, that took a company public ever. So if you think about that, so they're not used to seeing women. A women's business, when you're selling to men, they don't really get. However, we do sell amazing men's watches. Mm -hmm. So we made sure those were always in visually. And the men's uh, uh, used watch market is well established. It is, it's always been the aftermarket for watches has always been a vibrant market for a long, long time. They go to auction and, you know, certain brands like a Rolex appreciates. So if someone ever gives you a Rolex or you buy one and hold on to it, I guarantee you in five to six years, it'll be worth more than you paid for it. Yeah. Um, so certain brands, so by tying in products that men did have an affinity uh, into the presentation and using that instead of just a female focus, it helped. But it was, you know, 
I would say some of them still don't get it. Some of the analysts don't don't uh -huh. get it. And and well, then you have to say figure out how to talk to them because you're like, yeah, that's not our market, you know. So you have <laughs> yeah, to yeah. because um, because these guys are really smart, but you know, they miss it and they miss it because there's no affinity, and there's no precedent. They're, they're smart, and they all think they're smarter than they really are. Has been I, my experience. Well, I think if you don't have a one-on-one um, -on -one comp, uh -huh. they can't wrap their head around yeah. it, and yeah. that's the problem. We didn't have a one-on-one -on -one comp. Well, but you got it done. Did you say you had a story that followed? Oh my yeah. gosh! All right, so it's like, yay, we went public, and um, I I don't know if any of you guys. I mean, some of you probably sell stocks. I think short selling is evil, so I'll just put it out there, because you're betting on someone's demise. <laughs> um, but there is a whole, uh, what, what started happening, we were attacked either by a brand, and we'll never know, the, we'll never know who, um, or short sellers, or both, all right? And let me tell you what happened. The, we have uh, luxury consignment offices all across the U.S. where people can come in and get their fine jewelry and watches evaluated for free, and they're staffed by gemologists. And you get a quote, you can decide to sell it or not, we'll stand by it. Um, someone or someone's was calling the police on every one of them where they would raid the office and look for the paperwork. So can you imagine having like employees, like these police rush in, they're saying they've, they've got a tip that this is, because we fall under pawn shop rules. All right, so this is another thing. The rule, the laws never catch up with innovation. Mm. So yes, we had our ability. We were, and you, and those pawn shops are also zoned in different areas. So we had to make sure we were in the right zoning. We had all the right paperwork. But I have, and we did. But I have to tell you, we didn't always have it on site because we had it centralized. So literally, I think we had 15 offices. They were all, uh, the police barged into 12 out of the 15. But, I mean, by the third one, we had their game, so we had the paper, but it was still harrowing for the employees. And then, um, and then someone just showed up as a fake reporter interviewing people coming out of the store and trying to push their way into interview, and they weren't real, and of course, we got the police there. Then someone showed up at our um, op center and was handing out their card to our employees having lunch, saying, if you got stories about how horrible the real oil is, call us. Mm -hmm. All right, so we were barraged with, now I would bet money, because I know, now I know a lot more than I do, at least one or two brands was behind that, and I would also bet at short sellers. So it was, I guess I should have expected it, but it was insane, uh -huh. because our, and from my perspective, our, I was horrified that our employees were being threatened. So that happened. <laughs> and, then, and then COVID happened. Well, <laughs> so that was you, the first you, six months then of you, us you being you might as well tell the, the group about the next, that headwind. It was, it was police difficulties of a different kind. Which one was that? Well, you're the uh, raiding and trashing of, and theft from your stores. Oh, yeah. my God. Well, that's been, that's been during COVID. Yeah. Uh, that's... I, um, with every one of our stores has either been mob robbed or um, five to six people. And it's, um, there's a thing, I don't want to get too political here, but property theft is not high on the list of some of the district attorneys in some key cities. And consequently, uh, the police aren't going to arrest people that they can't, that are released immediately. So, and they have limited resources because of many of the cities have, re, have reallocated or defunded some of their police, and it's hard to be a cop, all right? So all of that's happening. And uh, every store we have now has been robbed once, if not twice. And uh, to the point where we've had to invest um, extra security, gates, um, our, we have a store in Madison Avenue that was just run in the daytime. We had active duty police, well, not sorry, off duty policemen standing out front and they still couldn't stop them because they rush in, they do a smash and grab and they rush out. They did drop some merchandise and they had blocked their car, but they ran on foot. So it's a little harrowing to be a retail owner now. And again, it's not, at least we were talking about this right now we have insurance, so we're covered. But that's this year. I don't know about next year. And again, if you're an employee in the store, you're under threat. 
And so it's, you know, we're always doing everything we can to make our employees feel safe. But um, I'm on a mission meeting with as many mayors that will talk to me to make sure that they know while it's property crime and you can always say, well, it can be replaced or who cares, no one was hurt. It, it absolutely hurts everyone, including the neighborhood. So that is a real threat. Yeah. Um, and it's, um, it's not isolated to the blue states, uh, Texas. I mean, what, what we found out, we opened our Texas store, the cops never showed up. We said, oh, we were busy that night. They cleaned us out. So it's, ev it's everywhere. It's a societal problem. It's a community problem. And it's a business problem. So I don't know what to do about it. We keep more, more secure, more secure, more secure. But uh, it's, it, we aren't the only ones. I mean, you read about it every no, day. No, that's right. Uh, one more uh, real, real question uh, on a, a, a happier note, and one that I think will be of relevant to a lot of folks here. Fascinating, uh, the little glimpse you gave me of your, your increasing use of AI in authentication and in other ways. Uh, but... Uh, it's all right. So this, this is remarkable. Talk about that a little bit. I honestly, we do take summer interns, by the way. So if anyone um, wants to work for us huh. in the summer, in our um, in all of our op centers, so we get goods in. Let's just say we get we get hundreds of thousands of goods in spread across three centers, but mostly in Perth Amboy and Phoenix. Um, and when you, what happens then is someone has to receive those goods. Once they are received, that's a very physical job. They literally check it in. They, they create barcodes. Every consigner has, a bar, has barcodes assigned, and every item's unique. So every SKU is unique, assigned to one person. Then the next step is routed through AI in terms of is it a high-risk consigner with high-risk goods? Is it a good that we've seen? Um, counterfeited on a regular basis. It, anyway, we have a bunch of algorithms that work in the background. They go to different locations in the op centers. For handbags, high value handbags, we are working on different algorithms where we can identify the first pass of a fake through um, high res images that then say fake or not pass on. So we are really using um, machine learning and AI to automate in a way, and take the risk out of our handling of materials. So everything moves faster. They all have different swim lanes. And even, um, we're e this is a different kind of auto automation, but it's still so cool. We have a huge, huge, huge gym labs. And gemologists have a lot of tools to measure different things. They can, they can, we have a tool that actually you put a stone under, it will tell you what the stone most likely is and what it's, where its origin is. Um, that's pretty common. but you know, not inexpensive. We have a lot of refracted machines, so we can get every stone throws off its unique refraction, so we can capture that. We measure the alloys. We can tell you when Cartier changed their love bracelets and their um, alloy mix, and we that's another, how do you determine fakes are real? But, right, every single person that is a gemologist measuring a stone does it by hand. And they have to do it twice. And we worked with a different university, University of Arizona, and we have a machine that measures right now only round diamonds um, more accurately than anyone else in the setting. And that actually gives us higher confidence. level. It actually allows us to have techs with uh, gemologist oversight. And it's super cool. So that whole center, while we employ quite a few people, has a lot of underlying technology that keeps it moving along really quickly. It's, it's really exciting. It is exciting. Um, so you're, in bar, you're a, a, a national success now with a company that uh, I'm convinced is on its way to gr greater success and all those, uh, hit all those marks that you're aiming at. Yes. Yeah. Um, but it was not always that way. And uh, uh, let me, let me uh, you, you were part of a, uh, several companies before. You led several before. One in particular got a lot of notoriety. Uh, so I was the CEO of Pets.com, right? Everyone knows that. Uh, maybe I, you, some of you guys weren't born then, so if you don't know it, it's okay. It was 20 years ago. But tell us that story. Um, look, at the beginning of, um, I, I've been in tech. So I started, let me give you a little, two seconds. I started my career at Clorox in uh, brand management and left Purdue and went right into that because, um, because of the great, and this is true, because of the great education I got at Purdue, I was the second undergraduate they ever hired. But 
uh, when I looked above me, I didn't, this is for the women in the audience, I didn't see any women above me that were in brand still. It's a while ago, so the world's changed. Um, they all went, after they got promoted a couple times, they went into HR. And I thought, oh man, I don't want to do that. And then um, I started, a guy literally smuggled in Apple II and ran a spreadsheet software. We were hand calculating. This is really dating myself. But I, <laughs> then I moved into tech in 82, and I really never looked back. Um, so early in tech, personal computer tech, and there's a lot of wins, a lot of losses. And so I would say, I would profile myself as more of a risk taker mm -hmm. in these things. Um, and uh, I was asked to run Pets.com, which was the first entry into the pet category in uh, 1998 after I had been running REEL.com, which was sold to Hollywood Video that killed it because they thought they were going to kill the internet. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> and which Netflix then, like, Reed gave me a call and said, how long do I have? I said, oh, I don't know, 20 years before uh, anyone's uh, going to come after you. Um, but uh, so pets.com, and uh, let's just say I was about 20 years too early, and uh -huh. uh, Chewy.com is public now. Chewy.com is, uh, you know, the current version of what pets.com wanted to be. But um, it was harrowing because... We raised a lot of money, not by today's standards, raised a lot of money, went public, and then I shut it down. And we got a lot of negative press, including um, from Jeff Bezos himself, who his company had put $60 million in. So uh, it was a tough, tough time. Uh, and uh, there were other companies collapsing. It was the dot-com explosion. It was all too early. One of them was Webvan who burned through about 1.7 billion. Mm -hmm. No one was talking about that. Everyone was talking about pets.com. And um, the little puppet became the, really, the symbol of dot-com um, excess. And we really weren't overspending. But it didn't, let's just say it did not help my career. <laughs> well, I, well, now I want to ask you about that in, in a minute. But you know, I, I couldn't help thinking, you talked about how COVID came at just the wrong time for the kind of business that you've built now. But um, uh, Pets.com would have, would have, I suspect, would have prospered uh, in, in the COVID era. Oh, would have, I'm sure. What, you know, yeah, I, mean, I'm, uh, I haven't People bought it. more pets and they couldn't go out to shop. That's right. So anything, yeah. but um, I haven't looked at their numbers with Chewy, but yeah. I'm sure they did well. I can tell you the vets are all stressed out. So, and I know Purdue has an excellent vet school, so I would say... They, um, I'm a pet owner. We need you. We need you to get out and take care of our animals. Yeah, it was. It's quite a time. The, but the, those the, those little animals sadly are coming back to the shelter now because people are like, eh, I'm done with you. So, I adopt out of shelters. Well, if there are any Purdue vet short sellers out there, shame on you. Yeah, that's right. right? That, that right? is a that <laughs> is a really bad negative. <laughs> um, but well, you say it uh, wasn't good for your career and so forth and. Sure, in a literal sense, that's right. But uh, there's been a lot said, and a lot said about you, about the there are virtue, there's some virtues in failure, lessons learned, and so forth. Um, but but talk a little about that. I mean, is is, is failure all it's cracked up to be? Well, I uh, so let's just set the stage. I mean, it was bad for me. All right, we had reporters knocking at my house. Oh, there was one other detail. Um, my husband asked me for a divorce the same day I was shutting down pets. So it was a very bad time, and, um, and I, it was just bad. Now, you fast forward, and it, and it took a long time to get better. I mean, you know, it took a long time. But there were some people are like, what did you learn about the business? And I always wanted to say, I learned never to talk to reporters. because, <laughs> But that wasn't really the answer they're looking for. Um, I would say that uh, the thing that I didn't expect which is pretty awesome, <laughs> and I wish everyone had this, I have no fear of failure. Mm -hmm. And I think it's because I failed publicly. I lived through it, and uh, I didn't die. I mean, there were moments where I wanted to crawl under a rock, but I didn't die, and I didn't even realize how much stronger I emerged until... Um, in fact, when I embraced on the real real, I knew it would be hard to get funding because the Valley, although they say they embrace failure, they really don't. No one likes to lose money. 
And um, also a woman, women get a, last year, they got 2.2% of all funding in Silicon Valley. So I, had a, uh, so I had a failure and being a woman, and I was 50. So these things are all almost a null set when you're raising capital. So when you put all those things together, I knew it was going to be hard. But you know what? I didn't care because I knew I was going to win. And I had no fear, and I never wavered, mm -hmm. ever. And that was the gift of that failure, especially, I think, being so public. It wasn't like my private failure. It was a thing discussed at cocktail parties, you know, which even the ones that I was at. So um, it really wasn't comfortable. Well, uh, congratulations. You, you set a great example because um, uh, no risks taken. And no, there won't be this one way not to fail. Never take a risk. Oh, it's we, pretty easy. It's yeah. the old armchair, you know, armchair quarterback, right? It's That's pretty easy right. to just sit there and pass judgment. But it's really satisfying to get out there and create something and, and have it work. I want to ask you about the, I, I think, maybe the most discussed uh, question among business people that I'm uh, listening to these days. And that's the shifts in the workforce, both its size and availability, the, just the simple availability of people. And then their attitudes toward work. I know we're well, working on it here, trying to accommodate changes, more uh, remote or hybrid work for those who want it. Um, so talk about that. Both, both what do you see happening and how is the real real dealing with it? I think every business owner, that's the challenge, is talent, yeah. Yeah. is getting talent. And um, we have multiple types of jobs open. We have uh, most of our employees are in the op centers, but then we have specialists. We are gemologists, brand experts, authenticators. Um, that are the authenticators tend to be homegrown and put through training programs. Um, and then we have a lot. Of, we have engineers, data scientists, brand you know brand people, merchants, a uh, whole analytic team that's separate. So we have a very wide range of jobs. And they're all hard to fill. And the motivations for joining the company are all different. So I would say that the key is, and we can't accommodate someone working from home in the op center. Right. But what we have put in place is um, we put um, training. If someone wants to be a gemologist, we'll pay for your schooling. All right? So we want to grow their own. Um, we do have food in the, more food in the op centers, more career pathing. Um, one of the things that people do tend to join the real real for is that we are really on a mission to get people to buy resale because we know it's good for the planet. So we're a mission driven company and we always talk about our wins. We're now lobbying in DC to open their eyes to the uh, fashion industry and how this is a fast win. So making sure that mission, it's a greater calling. Um, everyone has stock in the company, although that hasn't worked out lately during COVID, but it will, it will. Um, and I would say different people need different things, like certain, um, creating a family environment in the op centers is really important. Giving recognition is really important, and we just all have to be better. And I don't think we've got it figured out, but it is absolutely something that we think about every day. And I, it's not, for our company, it's not one size fits all. Yeah. Um, we're about to go to the student questions, just to put our panel of uh, interrogators on notice. But let, let me ask you uh, maybe just one more question, because you, you've come back to this issue of uh, recycling and sustainability and so forth, which is a huge plus. But a lot of the um, big name designers whose products you are selling are on those lists of, you know, uh, uh, that people keep of of companies who may be uh, using forced labor and, you know, and abuses of that kind. Is, so how does, that, well, how does that fit in your... You know what? I'm not sure they do anymore, but it's more the fast... It's really the more the fast fashion uh -huh. because they're more regulated. They probably do and we don't know it, but uh -huh. they're really trying not to. Um, I, I can't control them. Right. Um, but I can only do what, you know, what we do encourage them to work in resale, we get it themselves. Um, any, the European laws are ahead of the U.S. laws for all of that. And that's because they, are, they have more luxury brands in Europe, but they're more regulated. They're getting even more regulated. And the bad actors can be outed. And, and we saw this a few years ago 
where Burberry was burning uh, their products. And uh, they really got beaten up, and their public company they got beaten up, and they changed their practices. So I think there's enough social activism, and certainly there is capital going toward companies that are good for the planet, mm -hmm. that will keep them in check. And then our goal is just to get them to think, encourage their customers to recirculate their goods one way or another, and that's easier with some and harder with others. But um, but then you have someone like Shine. They came out of nowhere out of China, 19 billion with disposable clothing. I mean, that, that we couldn't sell because our, ours is our, sort of our underlying story. If it's made well, it should be resold. Uh -huh. So we want people to buy well so they can resell. Everyone pay close attention. Um, our, our students, thank you for bringing some great questions. And uh, I'm just going to uh, deal from the top of the list I, uh, as the, you were given to, they were given to me. So from St. John, Indiana, a junior from the School of, Mar of Management in Marketing, uh, Katerina Nikolovsky. By the way, you guys were all tough. I, read, I got a little sad. I'm like, wow, these are good questions. Hi. Hi, thank you so much for coming in. I really appreciate it. My question is to you. There are so many students, including myself, that share an entrepreneurial spirit and goals of starting their own company one day. Based on your many years of experience and success, looking back, is there anything that you would do differently in your college days at Purdue? And more specifically, do you have any advice for me and fellow students as we look upon our entrepreneurial journey in the future? So, I mean, you have so many more classes geared toward this at Purdue than I did. But I have to tell you, I took a, um, and I, I, you would have known him, you would have overlapped with him, Arnold, no, maybe not, Arnold Cooper, Arnie Cooper's class on entrepreneurialism. And it was the best class. I mean, it was the class I loved. And the reason I loved it, he brought in entrepreneurs, they told the story, they told their success, they told their failures. And, it, and, and then we'd have casework on, on problems. And that casework, along with hearing the, what, what they really did, actually opened my eyes up. And, and I would say that um, whatever you can do to actually either start th something right now, it can be small, um, you have to be able to, one of the key things when you start a company, even if it's your idea, you really have to set up a team to uh, offset your own weaknesses. And then you have to learn how to collaborate. And it's really fun if you can, so collaboration. So getting any classwork which requires collaboration, active problem solving. I know there's some competitions you can get in with case studies. I would say eat that up because the more you do, it will have an impact on you and plant a seed. And I would say, if anything, I wish I would have done it sooner. Cause I, but I was in high risk and I was CEO in early stage companies. It's a lot different when you start it yourself. And you learn, you're going to learn no matter what you do. And I would say, depending on your risk profile and your personal life goals, I would do it sooner rather than later because it's really rewarding. And you won't have a big public failure like I did. But even if you did, even if you, no, because it's, it's hard to do. You can, it's not something, <laughs> not something you really want. Um, but, um, but even if you do, I mean, it served me. I didn't know it at the time, and I didn't know the gift until I got back on the horse, and I'm like, yeah, I got this. So that's what I'd say. Thank you so much. Sure. Katerina, thank you very much. From uh, Fowler, Indiana, a sophomore in communications, Corey Honiger. Julie, Mitch, thank you so much for being here tonight. As I have looked at your career and all the twists and turns that your career has had, how do you evaluate the opportunities ahead of you and choose your next move? <laughs> well, now, I mean, honestly, my moves were chose for me during COVID. So I would say that, that what you have to do is always actually both have a long-term plan and then have flexibility when you think about it because you, there are things you can't control. And so you're always creatively problem solving and you have to think, we're public, so we have to think quarterly, but we have to think three years out at the same time. So it's, you just balance it all the time. I would say the more you get used to that kind of rhythm, the more natural it becomes. Thank Sounds you. like a squishy answer, but that's, that's all I've got. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Corey. Uh, and from St. Louis, Missouri, 
uh, a senior in biomedical engineering, which is very close to very close to the real fashion. real. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's very close. Yeah, uh, it's uh, Stella Erickson. Yeah, thank you so much. This has been a great opportunity listening to you um, talk. And I was wondering, what have been some of the greatest obstacles you faced in your career, and what specific steps have you taken to overcome them? Uh, I mean, uh, okay, women getting started in your career is it's still a man's world, so get ready. Uh, if you're a woman of color, it makes it harder, all right? So it's hard. Um, but I would say, you know, you focus on the business. You can't personalize things. You focus on what you can control, and you develop thick skin. Because even if you're in a corporation or you're in a, uh, you're starting your own company, you're going to be told no a lot. You're going to be told, you know, you're going to be told it didn't work. So I would say the more intellectual integrity you have around what you've done and you don't personalize business issues and you keep your eye on um, where you want to go, you'll be fine, but it's going to be harder for you. It just is. It's not, it's not over yet. When I, I was so naive when I got out of Purdue. I'm like, oh, I've got this, you know, because I was, women's movement was in the 60s. I'm graduating 1979, 80. I've got this. That was a long time ago. I, I, what's not, that's not what happened. So, um, but just, but don't get rattled. And also remember, when you start your career, you're playing, you are playing the long game. So you're going to have some wins, you're going to have some losses, and you may decide, I want to take, I want to go in a different direction. You may come back, but keep your eye on where you think you want to go and always be conscious of the trade-offs you're making because there's no such thing as work-life balance. So if you want a strong uh, life, then, then you're going to have to reset your expectations and work. And then last, remember the whole thing, find your passion, find your passion. I mean, it's hard to make money on your passion, but if you can find something you love doing, it never feels like work. A lot of times the whole find your passion can end you in, with like no money. And that means <laughs> that it may be your passion, but you're not very good at it. Um, <laughs> but if you can align those things, it's a, it's a big win. Awesome. Thank you so much. Sure. And thank you, Stella. And lastly, from Winnemac, Indiana, Jillian Brum. Hi, it's really nice to meet the both, the both of you. Jillian couldn't make it, but my name is Melissa. I'm a senior in marketing. My question to, Ju to you, Julie, is what setback do you believe that really, with what setback are you grateful for that allowed you to launch your career and make it as successful as it is? Well, my career, you know, um, honestly, I have to tell you, when, especially now when you look in hindsight, uh, just getting, coming to Purdue was I originally started in pharmacy, and then I decided I was going to go on, and I, I, if I was going to do it, I wanted to do drug development, and then I thought I can't be in school that long because I'll kill myself. <laughs> so, um, so I switched to what I thought was the be best a form of analytics and creativity, which I think business is, to be honest. Business is incredibly creative and incredibly analytical. And so it met both. So I'd say choosing Purdue um, was absolutely the right decision for me because I'm more of an analytical math person uh, with a creative bent. Getting in the right uh, major was important. And then in general, I would say, you know, just, and this is something you have to, it's so personal, you have to find yourself, it's just resilience. Because it, I know Pets was a big failure, but there are other failures before that. So you just keep going. And I would also say that there's a little bit of, and you got to watch it because you don't want it to be hubris. So it's like, yeah, I know that what they think, but I'm not going to let them define me. So a, little, a lot of that, it's like, mm, no. <laughs> so, but, but you don't want to read your own, now, the, the flip side of that, which is dangerous, you believe your own PR. So you, I mean, you can't, that is death. So what you have to do is always let the data and the real information speak to your decisions, but um, then you'll be fine. <laughs> and stay healthy, you have to stay healthy. Well, Thank you, Julie and Mr. Daniels. Thank you, what was your name? Melissa. Melissa, you're a great pinch hitter, Melissa. Yes. <laughs> Tell Jillian she couldn't have done any better than you did. So thank you <laughs> very, do. very much for, thank a you. for a great question. Thank you. thank you. So Melissa's question and your answer brings up something very interesting that you, you told me uh, beforehand, which is the importance of uh, 
data and, and analytics, which we have, we're trying to make ubiquitous here at, at Purdue, no matter where a student's headed. But you had an interesting observation, I think, uh, about uh, um, as some young people not understanding exactly what the, what the purpose is and what the real skill is. So first of all, we're in complete agreement that um, everyone will benefit by understanding um, how to work with data and how to analyze that data. But the people who win, and this is harder, is turning that data into information. And so I get presentations all the time. They're like, well, here's this. I'm like, well, what am I supposed to do with that? You know, what, where are we going? What problem are you solving? What, you know, that's interesting. What does that mean? So because you can get in data overload. So I would say understanding what the most important things are, understanding what information you want from the data, and then either doing the an analytics yourself or working with people that can do it for you. When you're getting started, and I still do this, you know, we have a lot of analytical tools that we use um, all the time, but what I'll do is download the raw data and look at it myself and cut it a different way to see if I'm missing something. Now, I could hand it off. We have a data analytics department, but that may take, uh, you know, two hours, and I want it now sometimes. So just having that ability to analyze the data to solve real problems and provide real information it is a huge win. This is a data-driven world now. But the people who are going to win are going to be the people that know how to create amazing algorithms and, data, and use data scientists. But more importantly, the business people are going to win by understanding what information they need from that data and how to put it into action. And that is, there's a gap right now. It's a real gap. I don't know how to close it, mm -hmm. to be honest, but there's a gap. Well, we hope that. Uh the faculty of Purdue and other people here will help answer that question. We, we certainly understand its importance. So uh, maybe time for one more. Uh, it's uh, commonly observed, and there are countless examples, of people who were, as you were, um, brilliant, had a brilliant insight, an innovation, created something new, in your case, a whole new uh, category. But uh, not, as, not, not too many of those people were then good at taking that great idea to scale and running a, a good business based on it. A lot of them broke down there, had to bring in other people uh, maybe to operate what they had, um, a, 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 a perfectly sound business theory they had conceived. You did them both. What, well, what enabled you to do both? Well, I started out as an operator, but I have to tell you, we, I brought, I mean, we are, up, we are upgrading our team all the time uh -huh. because the business is a lot bigger than it was. And we're bringing in different experts in every field to help us grow the business and scale it. And what this is a really fascinating thing. When you do that, we're, you still want an entrepreneurial mindset. Mm -hmm. And you don't want someone that actually doesn't, isn't comfortable taking risks because sometimes the, things, the business is still inventing. Some things they'll do will fail. And finding that hybrid of someone who can come in who has deep experience, which we're always looking for, but an entrepreneurial mindset, hard to find. Right. So um, that, that actually is where we're at. But I have a much more talented team than I am now. Having said that, the, the whole, there are some great examples. I mean, Bezos ran the company for, what, 25 yep. Yep. years. Yep. Bill Gates ran for, I think, the same. And I do think when the founder leaves, you lose the essence and, and strategic, maybe strategic oversight. And what you get is more of the same instead of innovation, right. because that that um, entrepreneur that started the company does bring a more innovative look at things. That's how the business started. And there's examples of those all over. I mean, in my category, um, certain companies, let's just say the precedent for the real real was eBay. eBay hasn't innovated yeah. ever in 20 years. Yeah. So, you know, that's the flip side of losing the, the founder. But they're, you know, the founder maybe couldn't run the company because it got so big. So, you know, it's a tough, it's a tough balance. Jobs needed, or Apple needed Scully, but then they needed jobs back because I think it might be a, an example of the, of the uh, conundrum you just described. Right. And look, I mean, look, after Bill Gates and Bomber didn't do what, what, the, what the CEO is doing now, too. So you need that innovation thinking mm -hmm. and that energy to think bigger. But the trains still have to run. They always do. Yeah. And that's, I mean, you know, we always say we go from hero to zero every day, <laughs> you know? Right. You know, like pretty, at the end of this quarter, that's it. You start all over. 
Well, Julie Wainwright, you've done an awful lot for this uh, university over the course of time. She's come back to old masters. Uh, she wouldn't tell you, but she has uh, endowed scholarships for women in the business school who might uh, follow a path similar to hers. And then, of course, you've shared this evening with us this evening. But uh, uh, nothing you've done directly is as uh, meaningful to us as what you've done indirectly by giving the world a fabulous example of uh, you're a category uh, uh, creator uh, in your own personal right as well as in the great company you've built. And we're proud of you, and we're really uh, appreciative that you came and joined us tonight. Oh, thank Please you. Join me thank you very much. Thanks to you all for coming. Thanks to the hundreds that uh, history tells us are watching by stream uh, uh, somewhere else right now. Uh, the uh, program will also be available for replay as usual at the website. So appreciate everyone being here, and we'll see you at the next one.